Coast. I cover from a little north of Los Angeles, um, or I guess down into LA occasionally, and then all the way up to a little south of San Francisco into the Salinas Valley and Hollister area. Um, most of my crops I work with, I do a lot in strawberries as well as avocados, citrus, uh, mostly lemons, and uh, as well as a lot of leafy greens, head lettuce, uh, romaine, spinach, so on and so forth as broccoli and everything else we grow on the coast and in our, in our row crops. So, um, I'll be presenting the majority of the, of the, uh, slides today. We'll have a couple, um, people, uh, chime in here and there on, on areas. And then if you guys have anything you want to add, I'm always happy to hear other people's experiences. Um, I click on the right spot. Okay, here we go. So Jen today we'll do some housekeeping. Um, updates, do a little introduction for Redox. There's some new names on the list here. So I just wanted to do a, another inter little introduction. Now, the bulk of today, we'll talk about kind of soil physics of potassium, things to consider when we're applying potassium, why we apply potassium, things like that. And then we'll talk about some new Redox results that we have as well as some, as well as some ones you might have seen before, talking about the role of potassium in cropping and some of the Redox inputs that can meet those needs and um, proven results that we see consistently in different cropping systems. So um, housekeeping, if you have questions, uh, there's a raise your hand button as well as you're permitted to unmute yourself and, uh, and ask it if you'd like. And then um, there's also a chat option that we'll monitor as well as a Q&A option. So reach out, we'll try and keep track of all of those different options and, and get, you all, um, get you all taken care of. Um, if you are on a phone or a laptop and you do want to ask questions, um, it's helpful if you use some type of headphone. Uh, it limits feedback. Um, if you don't have them, that's fine. Just um, if we're getting a lot of feedback, that's why. And then if you're on a mobile, if you're on the mobile app in your, uh, at least in my truck, you can play it over your Bluetooth as well as you can leave the app and it seems to continue playing just like you're on a phone call. So uh, kind of a nice feature of Zoom. So uh, that's housekeeping details I've got. So clicked on the wrong button again. Here we go. So who is Redox? Redox is a bionutrient company that focuses on sustainable plant nutrition, to put it simply. Uh, really concentrating on three key values at Redox. The first being passionately authentic, uh, excited, caring, and engaged with our community and our industry. I think everyone that works at Redox works here because we like our job and because we enjoy pushing, uh, pushing the boundaries in agronomy. And helping and helping growers. We're creatively driven, looking to find find new solutions to old problems and ways to ways to help um, increase increase profitability on the farm, as well as uh, as well as you know hopefully yield. And then um, significantly uh, scientifically knowledgeable. Uh, we 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 try to all be very proficient in our field as well as keep up to date on new new research coming out as well as concepts in in agronomy to try and bring the best value to the to the farm again okay here we go so put it simply redux exists to create passion and excitement in growing plants uh, i think that's why a lot of us got into agriculture and i hope that's why a lot of us are still in agriculture when it comes down to it that's um the the bottom line of a lot of the business is growing plants and um i find new interesting things out about plants every day and it helps helps to keep the job interesting as well as um, hopefully be able to uh, learn the system a little bit better. So I wanted to start here uh, for a group discussion a little bit of why do we apply potassium? So there's a Q and A function on your on your app or on your desktop there. You click on that and uh, just type in there some some thoughts on why we apply potassium to our crops. Or in the chat function, I don't know which one works. I can't see it from my side. There we go. Don Perry says cell wall integrity. Troy, we've got helps plants tolerate different stresses. Yeah. Regulate still model opening. It's a good function of potassium. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Water movement within the plant and fruit size. Mitch from Florida, yep, that's a, that's a major one in our fruit bearing crops. <clears throat> Firing roots and nutrient transport regu regulates sodium as well. Yep, all those are important functions of potassium. Let's see, I can click the 
these out. All right, I think that gives us a good overview of kind of the high points of potassium. So let's 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 jump into let's jump into kind of potassium. Um, I like this little video here of uh, uh, this is of a hop a hop farm uh, up in Washington, I believe, and the uh, the it's kind of nice. Uh, pota um, potassium is used in hops to help increase cone um, cone density. It's sprayed around flour when we have a lot of that rapid kind of bloom development, and uh, use die cap a lot in potassium. So it's a it's a good picture to include here as a potassium opening slide. Um, so we've talked, we've had other webinars about phosphorus as well as calcium nutrition. If you'd like to learn more about those, uh, feel free to check out our YouTube page and we'll refer back to some of those others um, throughout this talk. Um, but today we really wanna concentrate on potassium nutrition. Uh, so potassium plays physiologically a very, uh, a very integral role in a lot of different processes within the plant physiology and chemistry within the cell. Uh, it is the main um, cat, cation that's used for kind of balancing charges across membranes. Um, the vacuole tends to hold a large, a large um, concentration of potassium. That's, that's a reserve for use. Uh, it's an important part in the chlorophyll, uh, in, the, in, in the chloroplast for chlorophyll functioning, as well as for membrane um, integrity and protein um, conformation. All of these things are, thing, are chemical functions that put potassium the potassium ion plays within the um, within the cellular physiology. Um, notably, potassium plays a very important role in photosynthesis from a water movement standpoint as well as well. So, um, part there's kind of two parts of that. Um, the first being, as was mentioned by Felix, the stomatal opening and closure is regulated through potassium. So, as potassium um, is drawn into a guard cell in the stomata. It will open up the stomata and allow for a gas exchange. Um, and that in turn allows for water movement through the plant and solutes to be taken up and have overall water movement and solutes within the plant, the solute movement within the plant. So, um, and then as potassium is, is, is pumped out of that still model cell that will then allow it to close. And so potassium deficiencies or potassium issues can directly influence how fast the ability of that plant has to open and close that still model cell and, um, and that guard cell. And so that's a very, very important and acute place where potassium can have a major impact on crop physiology. The, uh, the other part is simply within the chloroplast, potassium plays a role there. In, in modulating reactions and making sure that things stay balanced and things like that. So we, it does play a critical role in plant respiration uh, on several different levels, as well as being a part of kind of what we look for in protein synthesis and overall crop growth. So potassium can be a very large limiting factor, which is why it's categorized into that uh, category of macronutrient, because there's a lot of it within the plant. So what's the challenge I, that we see with potassium? So potassium can be tied up and eventually be mineralized by soil chemistry. So I wanna dive into that a little bit more on how, uh, what the functionality of that looks like in the, in the soil. So, um, so here's a, a, a picture that we, of, a, of a clay platelet in, in, the, in the soil. We've got here, we have, here's a root over here hanging out. We've got some soil solution. Uh, and then we have a clay particle here, and potassium exists within the soil in three distinct forms. We have the fixed potassium, which is the potassium that makes up the mineral structure of the parent material of the soil or the decomposing parent material of the soil. So that's within the platelets of the clay and the felspars and the, and the micas that there's potassium that's in that, that's in that mineral or that rock if you want to call it that. The next is the exchangeable. Now this is the the part the potassium that you can think of it is attached to the surface or sorbed to the surface of that clay particle and this is the part that can come off of the clay particle and become available. Now that available form is the solution K potassium and that's the potassium that's solubilized in the soil solution that's available for immediate um, uptake for plants or for participating in soil chemistry and so on. Um, so about 99% of your 
potassium in your soil is fixed. Now this is potassium that won't show up on a soil report because um, it's not uh, available for um, immediate acid reactions. And so the exchangeable is about 0.9%. That's what you see in your chemical extract on a standard chemical extract on a, on a, on a soil test. And the soluble potassium would be that paste extract, or, which is about 0.1% of the total potassium that you can think of within your soil. So um, yeah, so the challenge with potassium, and this is what we, what we like to happen, is that as, the, as we have soil weathering and, and so on and so forth and the soil balancing itself and reaching an equilibrium, we have potassium moving from a fixed stage into an exchangeable phase, the exchangeable then into solution, then hopefully from the solution we get uptake from our crop and we grow, we grow a crop. Um, so the, the challenge, however, with potassium, this isn't true for every, for every um, element in the soil, is that the solution potassium can go to exchangeable. Well, now that's true for most for most cations within within the soil that it's gonna that they're gonna move back in, into this exchangeable solution. They're gonna have some interplay there. One of the challenges with potassium is the soil has a potential to buffer that potassium actually back into a mineral state where it's where it's highly unavailable once again and will take a decent amount of time to become available again. So that's a big challenge with with potassium. Um, what this so let's look at a couple of just soil tests here so this is a i lost my titles here for some reason but so this is a chemical extract and this is a paste extract on this side um so it's very common this is a very common type of soil sample for the california coast here where we have fairly low potassium but you'll see here we have 22 ppm of, of potassium in this soil and you know we got a, we still have a pretty low amount there's a pretty big differential here um you know about a fifth of it is here in, in available. However, if you look at a more of a higher potassium soil where we have something that this is more of a 7% base saturation potassium, you know, 254 ppm potassium, a lot higher, we still see a very, very small amount of potassium available in that soil solution. So um, very common. Uh, a lot of this comes down to kind of soil health. And we talked a lot about soil health uh, in a previous webinar. I encourage you to check that out. We had a great interview with Dr. DeCock from Cal Poly and talking about soil health and the role organic matter plays and nutrient cycling and things like that. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but I think it's important to bring it up here when we're thinking about potassium, that soil health does play a big role in, in nutrient availability in general, and that includes potassium. So soil chemistry plays an important role. If we, we need to have a well-aggregated, good structure, good micropore space, a well-flocculated soil, so we have good water movement and good chemistry going on, we also had need to, as biology increases, we'll see an increase in nutrient availability, nutrient release from those, from those soils, and um, a better cycling of nutrition within that soil ecosystem for the plant to take up. And then lastly, uh, plant physiology plays a very important role in that soil health as well. Strong, healthy roots will also stimulate a strong, healthy soil ecosystem and that will in turn allow us to have more available nutrition within the soil. So, um, so what is our, what's our issue here, right? So we have, we have this, this issue of potassium mineralization within the soil. Um, this really comes into play when we have large applications of potassium coming into a system. So when we have a large application, say, uh, you know, we're gonna go put out 500 pounds of SOP. Right, so you go put out 500 pounds of SOP. That soil, that SOP is going to be available in that soil for a discrete amount of time until that soil starts buffering that potassium back out of availability. So we're going to have a large spike in availability, and then we will have uh, a, that availability will tail off regardless of how much the plant uses. The soil will start to use, if you want to call it, use it or store it or remineralize it, um, and pretty much we'll get back to a, to a point where the soil has taken that potassium back out of plant available form and put it into the same form that we had before, which was thousands and thousands of pounds of potassium tied up in the soil that aren't readily available to plants. The reason we fertilize is to make sure that we have a sufficiently high amount of potassium available for that plant at that time during that specific crop stage, because not all the time do our nutrient available in the soil match our nutrient need by the plant. We so there's usually some type of mismatch there. We see that, that's why we fertilize 
we see we have a high K demand because it's hot or because we have a high fruit load or we're gonna get a big fruit set or we're sizing a lot of fruit or whatever it might be. We have a large growth coming on because of whatever, you know, so we need to have those nutrients available. So our, our challenge here is we can't, you know, right time, right place, right form, all that. We can't just pile on a bunch of potassium and then hope it'll be there in a couple months to, to fill out what we need, right? And I think we, we, most people have recognized that and that's why we've moved to more of a fertility system where we do a little bit of fertility more often. So, but one of the challenges even with, um, say we're fertilizing once a month, is that, that that mineral conversion of potassium happens on that, that will happen faster than, on that, than that time scale. So the solution to that is to apply a product that has been complexed. We have a complex potassium input that lowers the tie up leading to a more plant availability of that potassium. That allows us to apply a lot less product into the system um, to help allow that plant to take it up. So um, I wanna talk a little bit more about that now, I guess, in some of the products. The, um, the, the other option here is to apply a little bit of a, of other products all the time and maintain that availability. And we've seen that be very effective. And we've seen that effective with these redox products that I'm gonna talk about here in just a minute as well. But there's some other trade-offs that what we can we can discuss, we can discuss there. So um, yeah, so that's mineral conversion and that's and the way to overcome that is to satisfy that potassium's positive charge so that it doesn't get remineralized as quickly and it be, stays available to the plant um, for a longer duration. Um, Sam put in the comments here that we have uh, the link to our uh, YouTube channel. So if you're interested in some of these other webinars we've had in the past, um, check out the, the chat section. And she has a link there that she put up for our YouTube channel. It has all of our past webinars. And I'll refer back to that a couple more times through this talk. So, um, so the first product I wanna talk about is die cap. And we'll, we're gonna delve deep in, into each one of these. So this is just, and then, and then I wanna talk about a newer product, which is platinum. Um, and then H85. So three products today to talk about, and I really wanted to highlight H85 in the organic um, formulation that we have. This is the, we so have an organic formulation and a, and a conventional. Um, the organic formulation, this, this is an old slide, that's actually 18% potassium in the organic. And one of the challenges in organic is that um, sometimes potassium availability can be a big challenge getting enough potassium into the plant. The majority of potassium that's going out in organic cropping systems is either coming in in some type of compost manure form or from SOP. The compost and manure can have a lot of potassium but can in many cases have the potassium be um, tied up in um, that organic matter structure and can be very unavailable for a certain for, uh, for within our standard cropping kind of cycle, especially on the coast here where we have a lot of kind of fast, fast cycle crops, um, especially in the leafy greens. So that long-term release of potassium is not necessarily what we're looking for. We need something now. And that's where SOP has come in. That can also be a good, it is a good form of potassium, but it has the same issue of being remineralized as well as because it's a mined product, there is some, some solubility issues there as a dry product to get it available to the plant. So this is where a product like H85 can really come into the, to the picture. H85 has, um, I'm gonna go here, has, is a cumic base material that also has fulvic and long chain carbon complexes. Um, those function the soil to complex and chelate uh, mineral ions in the soil as well as to push soil microbial activity. That will allow for nutrient availability um, at a higher level, especially with some of these organic products where um, soil decomposition or decomposition of the soil has to occur before you have nutrient availability. So we've seen great impacts with H85. You can go back, check out our soil health webinar on that, on its ability to um, loosen up nutrition in the soil, um, push yields and kind of help with fertilizer program efficiency and efficacy, especially on the organic side. And we see the same thing on the conventional side where we can add in H85, especially in the organic matter soils, light soils, and see really good efficacy there. But that's all I wanted to really say about H85 um, and pushing soil biology here, because we really talked about it a lot in um, the soil health at the soil health webinar. And uh, yeah, I encourage you to go check that out. So um, the next product I want to highlight, and this is is die cap. 
So DICAP is uh, Redox's number one product. It increases plant respiration. It's a 03150. Um, so it's a really nice uh, P and K uh, content in the product, but there's also a lot more in that product besides just that potassium and phosphorus. So it improves plant respiration, antioxidant production, stomatal conductance, and then of course we have great potassium and phosphorus nutrition. Now the first feature of it on a nutritional side is that uh, the P and K that's contained within, within DICAP are complexed with um, amino acids, humic and fulvic acids to limit their tie up within the soil or on the leaf surface or within spray tanks so that we have a highly available product that comes in the plant. Now the products that we use to complex and chelate that P and K that's in that product um, are also used by the plant as soluble carbon sources. So we see an additional benefit from the chelating agent within the plant being used as either, you know, it's either amino acids to help the plant or some of these small soluble um, carbon compounds that that plant can break down and use, uh, use for energy. So, um, so in fact, DICAP as a formulation can be mixed with some of our calcium products, even though it has this very high phosphorus level um, and you can mix it with our mainstay SI, our mainstay calcium products, and we don't see immediate tie-up in the tank, and we can run that out as a tank mix, which is a really nice benefit to these products, especially as a foliar, that we can put a die cap out, we get our P and K, we can add it in with our mainstay SI, and we can get, um, we can get a good calcium and silicon in that spray as well, have a really nice way to boost crop, uh, crop quality, and and other characteristics. So, um, so that's the first feature. The other feature of it is we're really helping with plant respiration and stomatal opening and closing. And topical for this week is it really helps with heat stress uh, from a number of in a number of ways. It helps with antioxidant production within the plant, but also specifically the plant's ability to deal with stress. We've seen this notable in avocados here on the coast avocados don't like it when it gets over about 95 they get very unhappy and they get very unhappy over 103 they start dropping fruit and stuff like that and what we've seen is that in places where die cap die cap is applied or used on a regular basis that instead of the plant shutting down at at 10 in the morning when it hits 93 degrees we'll see that and starting starting you start to see the plant this plant start to stress We'll see that plant, that tree will hold on till two in the afternoon until it shuts down. And really, if you think about that over a summer, if you're getting four more hours or two more hours, or even, you know, even a couple, even, a, even, even 45 minutes a day more over the entire summer, where that plant is able to continue to respire and, and, photosynth and produce photosynthates and build fruit and not be stressed, you're going to have a much stronger crop throughout that summer and you're going to have a much better yield at the end of the summer with a happier, with a happier tree. So um, this is a, a graphic here, I guess, just showing kind of the, the impact of stress on the plant is the production of oxidants within the plant is the basic chemistry of when a plant gets stressed. There's unbalanced reactions that happen and the plant's unable to balance them and we start having degradation of membranes and a whole cascade of problems. And um, using a product like like um, like DICAP can help. I think this is a little overstated here, but can really help um, the plant deal with those stressors. And we'll talk specific rates here in a minute. If you want to learn more specifically about kind of the abiotic stress interactions, I go check out our YouTube page. Um, and then the second product or the third product, I guess I want to talk about is platinum. It's a one seven twelve as well as two percent humic acid. Um, really, imp really an improved potassium nutrition product and improved soil health through soluble carbon compounds as well. It also has a nice phosphate um, component in there, which can really help with root growth and potassium uptake and um, overall plant vigor. And uh, yeah, and, and this soluble carbon, con so soluble carbon content also helping push soil health, nutrient availability, nutrient uptake, um, very beneficial. And it's a liquid, which is also nice. So the, the, the high points, I guess, on, on platinum are really pushing this root growth to intercept nutrition within the soil and building a stronger soil ecosystem to help with nutrient uptake, which then, of course, will have above ground impacts on growth and fruit development, um, as well as this, you know, promoting, sorry, promoting this, keeping our potassium in solution and available for the crop during peak need. Um, very important. Okay, so 
Does anybody have any questions? I was going to hop in now into some Redox results. Does anybody have any questions on kind of functionality of potassium within the plant or um, those three products that we just talked about? I got a couple here. Um, Andrew says, how does KTS come into play for vegetable nutrition as a readily available K source? So KTS is potassium thiosulfate. Uh, potassium thiosulfate has the same is um, has the same issues kind of discussed as as uh, that the potassium is not particularly protected. So big applications of KTS, you know, you'll get a, a big availability of potassium, and then the um, it will get tied up over time within the soil. The thal sulfate material uh, cation can also be beneficial in some some instances where we have low salinity in the soil, where additional sulfate's not an issue. Um, it also has some elemental sulfur in it, which can also be beneficial in high pH soils to help bring down the soil pH. Um, so that can also be a nice feature of it. So get back it has a readily available kale source. So um, so it is a readily available a readily <coughs> available K source. However, we don't. Uh, we don't want to use it where we have excessive EC issues or, um, or excessive sulfate issues. It can be a challenge. Um, so, yeah, that's, I guess that's, that's where KTS fits in. Um, let's see. Troy says, we are seeing the same thing in artichokes. Three pounds per acre before a heat event keeps the plants moving where the untreated plants show obvious heat stress signs. So that's in referring to kind of what we've seen in avocados. And the same thing, we see the same thing in almonds in the valley and other places as well. So thanks, Troy. Yeah, that's, and, and that's a pretty standard, standard rate for heat stress. We'll talk about that in terms of rates in a little bit here. Um, any more on the, the Q&A? The Q&A section doesn't automatically scroll down when somebody asks a question, so I have to scroll down, sorry. Um, foliar versus soil applied, your opinion on foil potassium. So um, the, we'll talk about that, I guess. We have a, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, foliar versus soil applied and kind of how that, what that interplay looks like. So let's put a pin in that for the, for the moment, Troy. We'll, we'll get to your wingy face here in a minute. Okay, so um, click these done. All right, so, um, so let's talk crop stress. Oh, all right, no, okay. Let's talk crop stress for a minute and uh, cherry doubling. So uh, die cap reduces crop stress and trade oats. So we're gonna, let's jump, into, let's jump into a cherry orchard here. So this research was done by Drew Hubbard. He's a PhD candidate at OSU, along with GS Long Company uh, R&D staff, and looked at the evaluation of heat stress products for cherry doubling. This was done in Oregon. This was done over two consecutive seasons. So we have two years of data here uh, represented. Uh, looking at, uh, four different pro or three different products, um, an untreated control, die cap applied at two pounds preceding heat events, die cap applied at four pounds preceding heat events, and then surround and then micro cal. And then doubles were ranked the following season. So here's our average number of doubles. So we can see untreated control looking at around 30, 32 or so on the, in the count area. Uh, whereas when we had die cap used at two pounds per acre preceding heat event, we got a nice result here, kind of about half. Same thing with the four pounds. So it looks like kind of this two to this kind of two pound rate is probably a little bit more effective, and the four pound maybe a little overkill, um, specifically for the doubling issue. Now there might be ancillary benefits for long term yield and things like that, but specifically for doubling, we don't see a big difference between two and four. Surround so did work to some extent, but not as well as the die cap and the micro cal didn't really move the dial too much. So, um, so that's interesting. So the reason that this is happening and cherry doubling, I should have put a picture in here of what cherry doubling is. Um, you get, you get, you get a, two cherries kind of put together and it looks, it's, it's undesirable within the marketplace and that's usually a coal reason. And you can be a pretty high percentage of coal rate um, in blocks and what can happen the way, the, what I should have started with this, I guess of what, what cherry doubling causes cherry doubling is what happens is you get stress within, so cherries, back up here. If you're not familiar with cherries, cherries bloom and fruit very early in the fruiting season. Um, they're one of the first crops to bloom in a lot of regions. And 
then all summer they are building tissue and buds for the following year's crop. So what can happen when we have high heat events is that that, uh, that floral bud development can become damaged from excessive heat units and crop stress and that tr tree shutting down, not being able to effectively protect those buds. So when we apply, so the goal here is to keep the plant from, keep, allow the plant to deal with stress through those heat events. There's a lot of things people do in cherries to try and prevent doubling, overhead cooling, um, shade cloth. There's a lot of different ways that people, people address this issue. And um, so that's kind of where die cap or these other things come in. So the idea with surround is, you know, re reflect the heat, reduce the, re reduce respirate, reduce um, excessive loss of moisture through cuticles, same thing with microcal. The idea with die cap is let's give it as much potassium as we can efficiently with die cap as well as help to boost secondary compound production with, with, with the formulation of die cap. And so we see here that we get a nice reduction in cherry doubling because we've reduced summer stress um, and allowed for um, proper development of, 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 of buds. Okay, that's really nice. This uh, PowerPoint thing doesn't, uh, doesn't write down all of my stuttering. That's very nice of them. Okay, so uh, there was a follow-up that, that we did to this study looking at respiration rate uh, was also done on cherries looking at, at it. And they looked at two pounds of die cap that was soil applied versus foliar applied and looked at simple photosynthetic activity. One of the challenges with doubling research is you gotta wait a little, you gotta wait like eight, nine months till you can see the data. Um, so um, this is a nice, a nice way to look at kind of photosynthetic activity uh, with foliar versus soil applied. So what we saw here was photosynthetic rate. This was done during the heat of the day when the plants were stressed. We had a foliar application die cap proceeding and a drip application die cap proceeding. What we saw here was we saw similar, similar photosynthetic rate regardless of a foliar applied or a drip applied. So um, this leads, now there's still a lot of debate within the marketplace of which is better, I guess. Um, a lot of the times people are running water ahead of heat events, so getting a soil applied product out there can be beneficial um, uh, from a logistic standpoint then, but uh, foliar also seems to be a very effective way to do it if you're running a spray rig through the field or helicopter through. So um, that seems to be a nice, a nice way to do it. Um, one of the challenges I will say is that we don't want to run a bunch of extra salt ahead of a heat event. And that's one spot where die cap really stands out because our use rate is, you know, usually three pounds is our general recommendation preceding a heat event. And you're really not putting out a lot of excessive salt into the system um, because die cap is a very clean product that doesn't um, have a huge EC bump to your soil where some of the other products um, could do that if used at high rates to kind of precede a heat event. So um, that kind of answers a little bit, I guess, soil or foliar applied. Uh, jury's still out, but from this data, it looks like it, it doesn't matter. I still lean more towards a foliar. Um, if there's a spray rig going through, I'd prefer that, but um, if soil's the only way to go, it seems to work too. Okay, so that's, that's a specific stress, stress example. So let's jump in here to some yield examples. So I wanted to talk a little bit about here about asparagus. And I think I'd like Jason, um, our agronomist from out in Idaho, to uh, maybe comment on this trial, if he could, or this uh, field example. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Danny. Um, what you see, what you see in these, these pictures, this comparison was done by a colleague of ours out in Michigan, Eric Massey, and some of the guys he's working with there. Comparing uh, conventional potassium inputs to uh, some die cap inputs. This was conducted around Oceana County, uh, central Michigan, right off the east coast there of uh, Lake Michigan. Not far outside of Chicago, just above Lansing, but south of Traverse City to give you a general idea of the population. There's a lot of people, huge market demand for asparagus in that uh, geography. And so you could begin to understand how critical this little niche market is for these guys. Um, this particular grower, a uh, high input, high producing operator, you know, doesn't scrimp on the doesn't scrimp on the basics. He's very aggressive in his approach, trying to 
get to higher yields and higher um, fruit quality. You know, for him, uh, according to Eric, for him, this operator, he he produced yields upwards of 5,170 pounds, you know, per acre of asparagus. I can't personally imagine eating that much asparagus. Um, we're ditch bank harvesters out here in Idaho, so that's pretty impressive to me. 5,170 pounds. This guy thought there was room for improvement. One of those areas they thought they could improve on was in their potassium selection. You know, using the right products that minimize salt load to the soil as well as minimizing salt load to the crop. And so as they looked at some key opportunities, one of those was to switch away from the ADOT 60 murate of potash program that he had been running. You know, they apply anywhere from 120 units, roughly 200 pounds per acre, kind of a, you know, a season long type approach. And said for basically the same budget dollar, what can we apply in terms of, you know, a redox type program? And so they took that same dollar application on from Auto 60 and attributed that to a six pounds of die cap and also two pounds of triplex micro applied for the for the season as a as a direct comparison. And uh, not really knowing what the outcome was going to be, they did some comparisons. They really watched close to see where where any shift in uh, productivity might might uh, show up. And one of the first key indicators they come across was the improvement in um, in fern growth and fern development. Their typical growth on the fern side of production was anywhere from six to eight feet. And uh, when they started comparing what this die cap based program offered them, they saw an improvement, you know, 40, 50 percent. They saw a lot of, a lot of 13 foot fern growth factors showing up. And so that was huge, you know, setting that plan up in the fall leading into the next year's production system. There's a ton of energy stashed into that plant. And so as they get to the yield side of next year's production, they see a they see a 2,000 pound increase in overall asparagus um, production pulled off of those that field. And so when you translate that into dollars and cents, they took the same dollar spend on potassium, shifted from one one conventional input to a a die cap type input. And you know, 2,000 pounds is pretty significant as an increase. So to translate that into actual dollars and cents, you guys will get a kick out of this. Wholesale asparagus, you know, a regular spear sells at a dollar 12 a pound. And let's just factor in 2,030 pounds of increase in production per acre. That's 2,273 dollars of increase in gross dollars and this happened to be on a 40 acre field they treated the whole field and so you take twenty two hundred dollar rough increase across 40 acres you're floating with an additional 90 grand or better in your back pocket so that's pretty impressive how shifting spending the same amount of money spending the same dollars but shifting your focus to eliminate or reduce salt load you know from your potassium input um, improve overall phosphorus nutrition but also coupling a, a solid micronutrient program with your potassium to help improve plant utility plant uptake you know the efficacy of your of your phosphorus as well as your potassium contributes to huge, huge improvements in fruit quality as well as fruit production. And so as we fast forward a few more years, this same grower that was, you know, high yield at 5,100 pounds per acre is quickly approaching, you know, 9,000 plus pounds per acre in overall, overall growth under his current management as they look to 
So they look to advance, you know, some of their input selections. They change some of their management scenarios. You know, they're really dialing things in and getting, getting well paid for uh, their efforts. And I think that's just a prime example of what Danny's shared with us today is understanding soil chemistry, understanding how the plant responds to our, our inputs and what we think is best for that plant. You know, as we can, uh, as we can uh, minimize those physiological demands or the shifts that uh, that plant has to put in place just to survive, I think we can uh, we can see some pretty cool things start to play in our favor. So, Danny, I think that's kind of the gist of the the Michigan asparagus story. I don't know if there's anything you'd uh, like to add or if if there's anything I missed. I apologize, no, I but. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I think uh, Eric would be proud. He was unfortunately he was in transit today, so he wasn't able to join us. So we had to had had to tag somebody in for him. But um, yeah, no, Jason, I really appreciate you going through that. That was that was great. So um, had a couple more questions roll in here while you were while you were doing that. Um, any experience using die cap on row crops to combat heat stress? You know, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you take that one, Jason. Actually, since you're still on here. Yeah, you know, up here, central, central, uh, central Idaho geography, colleagues in Washington and Oregon as well on potatoes. We'll use potatoes as kind of the model for our row crop discussion here. Very much similar characteristics as to what you guys have heard from Danny so far on, you know, artichoke as well as avocado. You know, we don't, we don't get to run the kind of rates that they do in those specialty type crops, but we, we see a lot of benefit from one pound of die cap applied prior to a heat event that gives us a little staying power and helping bolster these plants, especially potatoes against uh, real high heat. You, know, you start getting much above 80, 85 degrees, you'll see it. You'll see it in the potato, they'll start to wilt that new growth in the top of the top of the canopy really shows it the most. You'll see a you'll see a lot of wilt in a, not a lot of heat. You know, 85 degrees, you'll start to see it. Where we apply die cap, kind of on a two-week basis, you know, flying with our fungicides mostly, we see some serious advancements. Not only in how that plant can cope with heat stress, but how we also can sustain. Uh, vegetative growth as well as reproductive growth. Um, DICAP's been a huge player for us in sustaining tuber bulking rates. Uh, as early as the onset at hooking, clear through the whole tuber growth cycle, DICAP plays a pretty key role there. And it, and it goes along the same lines as what you've talked before. You know, improving stomatal conductance, allowing that plant to respirate more efficiently during those high, you know, high heat periods, you know, maintaining ET rates as well. Get a lot of pull, a lot of pull and demand for water. Your potassium input needs to follow that water demand curve. This is a great way to help sustain all of that. So hopefully that answered your questions. Yeah, that's good. I have one other comment here from Ray down in Florida. Does the plant absorb product more efficiently through the soil or through foliar applications limited on soil applications? And I think that, yeah, foliar applications are a great way to put out die cap. Uh, it, we've seen it over and over again, just like Jason was just saying, uh, good efficacy. And uh, I, I prefer foliar over soil applied. Um, uh, I think you get a, a, a higher concentration on the plant and a better, a better potential for up for uptake, especially down in your neck of the woods where humidity stay high, so you have a lot longer window there for uptake and absorption in the plant as well. Um, over kind of some of the drier areas here on the west coast, that can be a little bit more of a challenge with the foliars. Um, you need to have some humidity there to kind of in the canopy to, for uptake, but it does it does still work. So um, great. Okay, so let's move out of asparagus now, and we'll we'll hop back into a or over into a strawberry field here. Um, we talked about this trial uh, a while back uh, we did this last year with Holden research looking at, at kind of the in comparing standard a standard potassium program 
uh, in strawberries versus uh, a redox, a redox um, potassium centric program. Um, looking kind of at, we reduced units by about 58% of units applied potassium to the crop and looked at a host of a host of factors, including average fruit size, comparative yield, applied units of potassium, applied units of K, significantly less units of K applied. Um, this would, in many cases, um, make people think that we're gonna have a major issue of in fruit sizing and plant's ability to deal with stress and things like that. Uh, however, because of the efficiency gains from redox formulations in die cap, um, and H85 and other products containing potassium, we saw a comparative yield that was unchanged between the two between the two programs, and we also saw no real change in fruit size uh, between the two programs as well. Um, I'm missing a graph here, we, um, but we all one thing that we did see was because the plants deal with stress better. We did see uh, that the plants can had a more even yield curve and hit hit markets that were higher because supply was down due to the market in general going through stress. So we saw an improvement in, in um, value per acre of about $2,000 an acre over the, the duration of this trial. So that was a nice thing to see. Um, kind of built off of that and simplified with a newer product to Redox, which is RX Platinum. Um, and this is fresh off the fresh off the computer here. So we just got this all tabulated up actually this morning. So I'm excited to share this data with you guys. Looking at strawberries, this trial was done to compare RX Platinum to current grower standard potassium phosphorus programs. So looked at weekly yields over eight weeks, um, you know, program cost as well as tissue potassium. So um, there we go. Um, so this was done with a grower cooperating redox R&D. What we did was we did RX Platinum, weekly applied at 0 0.75 gallons per acre versus the grower standard. So these came out to this to pretty much the same cost. We'll see that in a minute. This is done Ventura County. Um, nine weeks, that's a typo, it's supposed to be eight. Um, and really the goal here was to compare RX Platinum versus the standard program, which was potassium nitrate, MKP, and a couple other, a couple of other inputs, I believe. So um, all other things held constant. So uh, weekly cost was about the same. Um, so both the programs came in around 40, 45 bucks. And, um, but what we saw was average yield per week was significantly increased um, over, uh, over the two weeks. And uh, so we saw, what we saw here was, we saw about a 17% bump here in yield between the two weeks. And because we had it replicated over several different weeks, we could look at it kind of from a statistical standpoint. And we saw some weak correlation that did indicate that we saw, um, uh, did see an actual, a, a real increase in, in yield. And this isn't just an artifact of sampling. Um, so um, looking at kind of the data more on a timeline basis, we have here average yield over time, trace per acre, and you can see kind of, you know, we go up and down the, the orange bar or the orange line here, here's the RX platinum treated blocks. There was 18 acres, three different blocks that were kind of, that are summarized in this data as well as another 18 acres, three blocks summarized in this grower standard, this grower standard line. So you can see um, at the beginning, we, we started application two weeks ahead of this. At the beginning, we had pretty paired, um, pretty matched paired yields here. Um, and then we had some nice early season uh, or not nice and bad early season heat events, I guess. And this is why this is the tail end of strawberry season in Oxnard because it starts to get too hot for strawberries. They don't really like it. And we have these high heat events where we bump into the nineties. A lot of the fruit will ripen and they'll ripen very small um, and will not allow for a lot of high tray count. So we'll see that here. We have this, we, we had a 93 degree bump here over the weekend. And then that we had a small yield bump here um, of small fruit that keep, that were harvested, but then we because all that fruit was was um, ripened, we saw a decrease in yield over the next couple of weeks due to plant stress, and we saw another bump here in in heat as well. So what we saw overall um, in the field, especially, it's hard to look at a graph and tell you the field what you know related to the get a picture of the field, but in the field we saw a much more level yield, irregardless of temperature in the field, and as well as we saw a nice continuation of size 
on these on these other weeks where we saw this nice kind of flat yield curve, which is really what we want to see is these kind of flat yields over time at a, at a, at a higher at a nice high rate. So um, so that was nice. Um, we also got back some of our leaf tissue analysis, and we saw that leaf tissue analysis was also sufficient in our RX platinum treated blocks, um, uh, both in old and new leaves. So we saw a nice sufficiency there. Um, and it was slightly elevated over the grower standard. We're still waiting to get back a little bit more data on this leaf tissue so we can kind of do some statistics, but our initial, um, initial indication is that leaf tissues actually were improved by platinum application over the potassium nitrate-based programs. So um, that, was, that was the end of that. So uh, key concepts I think that we've covered today that I just want to review is that um, Potassium available is in fixed and get, uh, exchangeable in solution form, um, and that can move back and forth. Organic matter and soil health plays a key role in, in the ability of the plant and, and the ability of nutrition to be available for the plant. Um, H85 can be a great tool to help with nutritional availability as well as soil health, especially in organics to help with potassium nutrition. Um, as well directly through its content and indirectly through increasing availability of other products that are applied and natively available potassium in the soil. Um, die cap, heat stress, one to three pounds per acre is a foliar soil applied. Applied a couple days before heat events or during heat events can be a very effective tool to help plants deal with stress. Plant nutrition, it can also be a great standalone potassium source um, one to three pounds, depending on the, on the application. And we're going to talk about the die cap a little later in the season about bricks and color and things like that. So that should be an interesting discussion. Um, platinum as well, plant nutrition. We see that platinum in a very high input crop, even like strawberries that we've seen at fairly low rates, three quarts an acre per week. We've seen very good, uh, efficacy of it as a potassium input to help, um, help with potassium needs. Root growth can be a very nice plant establishment product at low rates as well um, to help deal to help push root growth. So that's another place that platinum fits in well. Um, some standard rates that we're using: um, platinum per week, half a gallon to three quarts a week during during fruit during times of fruiting. Uh, platinum in avocados, um, 0.75 gallons. I like in May, June, and October. I think is is the timings that we're recommending. And then switching over to die cap in the summer due to hot, heavy heat stress and getting a little bit more units of P and K out of, uh, as well as the ability to helping the plant push to deal with stress better out of, out of the die cap product, maybe three to five pounds per acre in July, August, and September. And that right there is a very big avocado. You see um, one, one pound, 14 ounces. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, and uh, HA5 organic, Three to five pounds per acre every two to three weeks is what we're looking at um, in, in a strawberry type situation. Um, and then in a organic vegetable situation like this, we might be at, you know, a two pound, pound to two pounds at planting, and then maybe another, another pound to two pounds uh, a couple weeks after that. Uh, platinum also 0.75 gallons per, uh, per app, uh, or at van, per acre banded in at planting or um, something like that would be a good, a good fit for that. Um, I hope that today we, um, I was able to communicate our uh, passion about and excitement in growing plants. I really think that um, this slide summarizes the, the, the underlying why we do this. And I, I hope that came across. Um, I know a lot of people were on this looking for an hour of, C, of CCA units. You will get a follow-up email uh, from, for for that so everyone will get that email with the sign up sheet and the barcode or the qr codes that you can sign in and get your one hour nutrient management once i have that from um, the cca folks so with that i'd like to say thank you for taking taking the time out of your day to listen to um, and participate in this webinar it really was it really was fun um, to talk to everybody about this topic a lot of good questions um, i got a couple more questions here so we'll just jump right into those and please send your questions if you have more, um, uh, if you have more, uh, I'll start with the first one here. I've got, uh, was the, was the platinum applied? Was it foliar or drip applied on the strawberries? That was foliar or sorry, was drip applied. It was drip applied through the drip, um, through the irrigation system and was, um, applied weekly. So it, uh, platinum does have a foliar label on it, but in that specific case, it was applied 
through the drip. Okay. Um, let's see. I've got a question here from Raymond. Uh, what products are in RX Platinum and rates per products in a gallon? Yeah. So um, Platinum was a product that we developed out of a couple specific use rates where people were doing tank mixes of other Redox products. The, um, the origin story of Platinum was we had a client that was consistently applying two pounds of DICAP, a pound of Rutex, and a pound of H85 and uh, for uh, in, in their system. And it was performing extremely well, um, but they wanted something a little easier to handle. Uh, so we developed this Platinum product um, out of that kind of general um, request of combination. And we've seen that it actually performs, um, it seems to perform actually better than that combination um, in the field and comes in a liquid form and in totes, which is a very convenient thing for larger scale operations that we can have a liquid product, no blending required, no agitation, um, good tank stability, uh, and has an ability to um, blend with other products. So you can put it in a foliar with calcium products if you wanted to, um, or put it in a custom blend going out in, uh, going out for a uh, crop blend of uh, with uh, even with CN9 or something like that. If you wanted to combine it with something like that for a short amount of time, it could be gone, you could go out and do that. So um, a really, really a rising star in our portfolio and something we're very excited to continue to find fits for in the marketplace. So um, Jeff Hunter says, how is die cap uptake through center pivots in potatoes? Jason had to duck out and go into another meeting here, it looks like, but um, we've run, uh, we've had good results in center pivot through potatoes. Let's see, Jeff, are you still on this call? Are you able to answer that? This is John, I'm on. Oh, John, you wanna answer it? That'd be great. Yeah, we we see no no difference in efficacy of water running die cap versus foliar. Uh, the only comment that we occasionally get is the foliar application, the plants seem to respond slightly quicker, mm. literally without within hours versus when we apply it through the center pivot. The response is like 24, 48 hours. Um, in addition, we've done testing on tree fruit. Uh, treat soil applied versus foliar statistically the same uh, with just a very slight unstatistical but a slight favor to soil applications okay thanks John uh, all right any other questions we can help anybody with really appreciate everybody sticking around um, I know we went a little over time but um, yeah Try to shoot for 45 minutes. That didn't quite happen today. Um, we got, we're, we're working on putting another one of these together for in June. Um, we'll keep you updated on what the topic's going to be and, and what the specific date will be. Um, but so check your inboxes for that. And we appreciate you guys signing on. I'll hang out here for a couple more minutes. If you got a, any more questions you want to throw over, we'll uh, be happy to answer them. But uh, thank you. <laughs>